synthetic oil. Some people swear by it, other people swear at it. Hi, I'm Lake, the motor oil geek, and to separate the facts from the fiction about synthetic oil, we're here at Chevron Phillips in Houston, Texas, and we're gonna let my good friend, Dr. Ken Hope, tell you the facts about synthetic oil. So in a previous video on the history of motor oil, we discussed how the chemical properties inherent in the crude oil would really have a giant influence on the performance of the products that were refined from that crude oil source. That's why the Pennsylvania brand oils became popular for motor oil because the Pennsylvania base oil was paraffinic. Right. Those base properties depend upon the crude source, whether it's naphthenic or paraffinic, you get different properties that come out of those, whether they're beneficial at high temperature or low temperature, what have you, but it's different properties in general. But unfortunately, that crude oil is a chemical cocktail with millions of different molecular structures. Mm -hmm. Some are good and some are bad. And of course, you know, the additive industry de developed to try to solve some of those problems to make up mm -hmm. for some of the deficiencies or enhance the certain properties that were there. But the reality is, if you don't have it in the base, mm -hmm. you really can't fake your way out of it with additives alone, can you? Right. There are definitely certain properties that are only base oil related, like mm -hmm. the volatility and, and things like that. So, But there are things that additives definitely do, and working together with the base oil is, is kind of what formulators do today. But you've got to start with a very good base oil. And so the molecular cocktail, as you mentioned, is a good description of what you get with a mineral oil. And some of these components like isoparaffins, you have naphthenics, you have cyclic components, some heteroatoms. Some are good and some are not so good. People actually tried to take their little molecular tweezers and, and take out some of those bad components. Just to get down components. to the goods. Yeah. Because there's some good stuff uh -huh. in regular crude oil that you could, but the process of trying to get down to just that few good structures essentially would be... Very time consuming and very expensive. expensive. Right. <laughs> so, so funny enough, right, in that same video on the history of motor oil, we were in California, in Los Angeles, and that's where this idea of synthetic oil mm -hmm. came from because you were wondering where we were going like how does it have anything to do with synthetic oil well that's the whole origin is that people knew all along mm -hmm. there were good molecules and bad molecules someone came up with the idea of well can we reproduce what we know is good exactly and that process i mean that taught us a lot we we came to understand what things were good and we also understood that well we can't just focus on certain good materials. They really need to have a variety of good materials. Explain not why. Not the same thing. Okay, so if, if all the materials are like straight chain hydrocarbon, and there's just like- You have this perfect shape where yeah. it's this nice backbone and it's got mm -hmm. a little bit of branching to it, but if they were all the same, what would happen? Yeah, so then they would all stack up and you would have a wax. And that's no good. And that's no good. <laughs> so what you have to do is have some chemical diversity, some way to create multiple things that are good, but in different arrangements of the atoms so that uh, you need a that, range of good yeah a range of good and then if you have that diversity you won't have a wax you'll have something that flows down to very low temperatures and that's really the big giant benefit mm -hmm. of we say synthetic oil what we're really talking about primarily and there's some definitions we can get to later mm -hmm. right a poly alpha olefin synthetic and that's what we're talking about is that in the lab, you can manufacture, like taking a Lego, right? You've got these hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm. Imagine Lego pieces, and you're building up what you want from these smaller molecules. Right. So we can take this, those smaller molecules. We can actually start with ethylene, which is two carbons, mm -hmm. and we can build that up to an alpha olefin. And then we can select one particular alpha olefin. Then we can oligomerize that with a chemical catalyst. Mm -hmm. And that catalyst does a couple things. One is it, you know, joins them together to a specific 
molecular weight range, mm -hmm. it also introduces some isomerization. So we get the branching, we get that chemical diversity that yeah. we want, and it can do it very efficiently and make hundreds of thousands of different isomers that give you products that are very good at low temperature and also have a very discrete molecular weight. So you get very good volatility properties that you really want. Because that's the, the giant benefit of these PAO synthetics is they perform extremely well at extreme temperatures, both extremely cold mm -hmm. and extremely hot. And really they have an origin in aviation, going back to like World War II, right? Yes, actually there was some need for, for fluids that were gonna be performing at low temperature because high altitude means very low temperature. It gets very cold up there. You want the equipment to work well. You don't want a lot of resistance and that's what viscosity is, is. the measurement of the resistance, resistance to, to flow. flow. Right. Yeah. So by being able to synthetically create those molecule shapes that allowed for lower temperature operation, mm -hmm. it opened up the window of operation for the aircraft. And so those benefits are also observed in other applications mm -hmm. like transportation. For instance, you want enough viscosity to be able to protect and resist wear mm -hmm. and prevent metal to metal contact, but allow for things to move with relatively low resistance, good frictional properties. If something is too viscous, then you've got some drag. viscous losses and drag, and that costs you in energy efficiency. And, and it generates yeah. heat, which makes yeah. the oil even thinner, even, which is like a downward spiral. Yes, and a lot of applications really can take advantage of those of selective properties. Well, I can tell you guys this, working with this guy and using their synthetic base oils at Joe Gibbs Racing, we won a lot of races and a lot of championships by taking advantage, not just of these thermal properties in terms of low temperature operation, mm -hmm. high temperature operation, but there's some other things about these mm -hmm. in terms of heat capacity and transfer yes, that yeah. I think we should go to the lab and let everyone see how well these products actually work in those applications. Fun fact. The world's first synthetic motor oil was blended right here in Superior, Wisconsin by Amsoil. That original formula was a full ester. Later, they changed to a PAO ester blend, which is what's in the Signature Series today. So if you watched the previous videos, you know, like one of my favorite base oils of all time, one of my favorite chemicals, is the metallocene catalyst PAO 100. This is my favorite thing ever. That was made right here. Here. <laughs> this is the birthplace. Okay, so Ken, what do we have here? So this is a typical reactor and we would use this for doing all kinds of different experiments, such like, you know, making MPAO 100. In this reactor setup, you've got a container where you bring in the feedstock, You've got a reactor where you control the temperature, the pressure, how, how fast you're feeding the feedstock through there and following the different conditions of the reaction along the way. This is so, where you build the Legos. Yes, this is where you build the Legos. So once we've built the Legos, then what do we do? So then we have to figure out what we made. We have to analyze it. There's a, a lot of different toys, tools that we would use mm -hmm. to, to figure out exactly what the properties are gonna be like. So. I bet one of them is a gas chromatograph, right? That's correct. I think we should go see that. Okay, Ken, where are we and who's this guy? Okay, uh, like we're in the laboratory now and this is Dr. Tom Malinsky and he's gonna explain the gas chromatograph and how we use it for analyzing our oils. Absolutely, so the GC here, as we like to call it, this is the workhorse of a lot of the things that we do in the labs. And so what this is doing is separating the components based on the sample that we're injecting into it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's separating them based on their boiling point. Okay. So it's kind of like a mini refinery in, the, in a sense, that you're separating out things by boiling point. Absolutely. And so because we are using pure alpha olefins to make our poly alpha olefins, mm -hmm. what we can actually see is the discrete cuts of these right. different fractions. And so you know, we can tell the C20s versus the C30s versus the C40s. Based on those components, it's going to change things like our viscosity and our thermal properties. Okay. And that's the big thing, right? Is synthetic oil really has like four really key benefits, at least in my opinion, that one, you have these great 
thermal properties in terms of its ability to absorb heat. Then it also has this great ability to reduce friction. And it's got thermal stability in terms of it doesn't want to break down. But you also mentioned something about the heat transfer as well. Right, so that's very important. And so you mentioned absorbing heat. So that's the specific heat. That's what we measure as uh, the ability of the oil to absorb heat from wherever that oil, wherever that heat is being generated. And so heat is often a bad thing in oil because the higher the heat, the higher the reaction uh, rate. So oxidation, yeah. Oxidation, oxidation doubles every 18 degrees Fahrenheit, roughly increase. Degrees C. Yeah. Other chemical degradation, all those kind of things happen faster at a higher temperature. temperature. But there's also the generation of the heat. So that's where the coefficient of friction comes in. If you have a lower coefficient of friction, like PAO compared to mineral oil, then you're generating less heat. So the heat generation from the friction or combustion or wherever heat is, mm -hmm. is, is happening, but then absorbing that heat so it can be transmitted away. And then that gets into the third one is a, a heat conduction, thermal conductivity. So like the better the thermal conductivity, the, the better you can conduct that heat where it would be lost to an evaporator or to the system or whatever heat sink you have in your system. And so, Ken, you mentioned the coefficient of friction. In the lab, we like to measure that. We have a cool instrument called the MTM. Uh, we can run experiments on that where we're actually measuring the coefficient of friction and showing that the PAO, it actually lubricates better, right? Yeah. And so it's reducing that coefficient of friction. So you're not generating that heat through the friction uh, in the first part. And then uh, we can actually show that the PAOs are gonna run cooler than things like mineral oil. Right, and see, that's the thing. This whole mineral oil versus synthetic in heat, there's a lot of myths out there about this, that especially in the air-cooled engine world, where this notion came about that because the synthetic oils had a lower oil temperature, that somehow or another they were trapping the heat in the engine. They weren't absorbing the heat. And that's one of these, I guess, un misunderstood things about specific heat. Yeah. Explain what specific heat really means in terms of that relationship. It's the ability of that oil to absorb the heat. And mm -hmm. so you can, you can measure this very uh, specifically, mm -hmm. very detailed, and get an idea of what ability that oil has for, for sucking out that heat. But that heat has to be transmitted away. Yeah. And that gets into thermal conductivity. And those are different. Actually, there's about 11% difference between a mineral oil and a PAO. A PAO has a higher specific heat. So, so it's pull more yeah. heat in. More heat faster. Before the temperature goes up yes. to one degree Celsius. Exactly. exactly. And, and that's why in a PAO application, if you look at the temperature, you'll actually see the PAO running a little bit cooler. Mm -hmm. And you can see that in the MTM. Yeah. It's right. actually taking more energy to heat up the PAO so it's able to suck more out. Yes. So it's really a twofold thing. The reason why people misunderstood synthetics in terms of temperature is that one, the synthetic oil generated less heat from friction, mm -hmm. and then two, it was absorbing more heat from the parts for the same increase in temperature. Exactly. So it was doing a better job cooling. And I know this to be a fact because when we were building racing engines mm -hmm. for NASCAR, when we worked with you guys and we developed very specific formulas to take advantage of these properties, we were able to bring the temperature of the engines down, not just the oil temperature. Of course, horsepower went up when we did that, but we were also able to bring temperature down on things like valve springs and pistons, which were the weak links in those engines so if we could bring those temperatures down the durability of those parts went up and that was huge so i, I feel like that's one of the things again people miss understand about synthetics now we're throwing around these terms synthetics so in the context of this video what we're talking about is polyalpha olefins which if you're astute about base oils that's a api group four base stock there's a spread of what people consider synthetics in the marketplace so explain that a little bit yeah so when we're talking about synthetics we're meaning in a chemical sense where we're taking smaller molecules and building them up to larger molecules those designed molecules uh, of a certain molecular weight 
that that we're making on purpose. That's different from taking a refined product and chemically modifying it and then calling that synthetic. It's, Which would be a, a group three, yeah. API group three. So group API classifies base oils into five groups. Groups one, two, and three are refined mineral oils of different degrees of processing. By hydro cracking and things, they can reduce the amount of sulfur mm -hmm. that's in the oil because sulfur is in crude, and they can raise the viscosity index. But that's right. PAOs are group four. They're their own classification mm -hmm. because they have a high viscosity index and no no sulfur and a unique. Uh, process that people use is generally the same uh, for making PAOs. Right. So that's why it's they've got their own own system. And then group five would be the catch-all for everything, everything else, else. Right. esters and, and, and algae and hydrocarbons, everything. So Nathenics and things yeah. that necessarily aren't better for engine lubricants, but they all fall into that five category. Right. Yeah, some of them which are esters and alkylated naphthalene, so it's goods and bads in terms of engine lubrication. So, because that's a misunderstanding sometimes that people think that group five, the highest number, somehow is the highest quality, highest performance, and right. that's just not the case. Mm -hmm. They each have their own unique characteristics and you can put them together to create, take advantage of those things sometimes. Exactly, sometimes, I mean, you need all of those things for different applications. There's, they each serve their own purpose. Yeah, they can be tailor-made to a certain application. Mm -hmm. Right. See, isn't this cool? I mean, tribology, I think, is the absolute coolest of all the sciences because it's really kind of a collection of science. Yes. It's chemistry, it's physics, it's mechanical engineering, it's it's all those things all together, like all at the same time. And it touches and absolutely every everything. Yeah, it's everywhere because everything that moves has to be lubricated. Yeah. Friction is everywhere, and friction is the enemy. Sometimes, but sometimes you right. need friction. Well, like if you want to walk. <laughs> right. Yeah. We couldn't move from one place to the other if there was no friction, because we have to have friction between the soles of our shoes and the floor. Otherwise, we would just sit here and spin our wheels. We wouldn't want to walk around <laughs> on PAO. We would, it would not be. It would not end well. <laughs>